All right, what's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. Today I'm drinking an iced caramel macchiato from the convenience store. It's quite good. I love how Korea has these instant coffees of many different varieties that you can kind of put together, make yourself, or just take them right out of the freezer. Before we get started, I just want to say I am back. I know I was gone for like two months again. If you want to keep up with me a little bit out of YouTube and a little bit more personal, then feel free to follow me on my Twitch live streams. That's at twitch.tv slash terrytvlive. Also, link for that is uh, down below. Today, we're going to be talking about the case of Fusako Sano. She was a nine-year-old girl who was abducted on her way home from a baseball game after school one day. She was abducted by then 27-year-old Nobuyuki Sato, and he took her to his home, locked her in his room, and kept her there for nine years and two months. She was nine years old when she got abducted, and she was about 19 when she was finally freed. Now you're probably wondering, why did it take so long to find this girl? What were the police doing? What was Nobuyuki doing with her? Why did Nobuyuki abduct her? And to be honest, it's just, it's a tragic combination of lack of effort on the police's part, um, just not doing their jobs properly, things going wrong at the wrong time, making it work out easier for Nobuyuki and this whole abduction. And honestly, everything would have definitely been solved a lot faster if mistakes weren't made. Anyways, let's first talk about Fusako. Who was she and how did this happen? So Fusako was just a nine-year-old girl from a small prefecture in Japan called Sanjo City. It's kind of like a small town. It's surrounded by mountains. It's like north of Tokyo. It's a lot of forests around it. And one day Fusako was watching a baseball game, which a lot of people did at the time in their, you know, free time. And once the baseball game was done, she was just casually minding her way going back home, which a lot of students did at that time. But like I said, it was a small town. A lot of the adults and, you know, uh, parents, they watched over the kids and made sure that they were okay and getting home safely. But again, it's just wrong things happening at the wrong time and just nobody unfortunately was there for Fusaku on this day. It was November 13th, 1990 when Nobuyuki pulled up in his car and he held like a 16 inch knife right to Fusaku's chest and told her, hey, get in the car right now or you know, you're in trouble. And imagine being like a nine-year-old girl, like not much you can do in that situation. Frozen, trembling, paralyzed, she had no choice but to succumb to this perpetrator and let him put her in the trunk of his car. And just like that, she was gone. All right, so that's how it all begins. Now we talked a little bit about Fusako. Let's talk a little bit about Nobuyuki. Who was he? What were his intentions? What was his motivation? How did he become this type of person that could think this was okay in his mind and he could get away with it? So Nobuyuki was from a different city, a little bit south of Sanjo City, which is where Fusako is from. He grew up with his mother and his father, but his dad was like, he did not have a good relationship with his father. His father married when he was really old. And so because of that, from what I've read, Nobuyuki was teased in school quite often for having like an elderly father and I think it put a lot of mental stress on him and you know kind of hindered his ability to grow up under normal social environments if you will. Plus on top of that you know it's like your father's way older than you like in his 50s or 60s and you're just in primary school or middle school or whatever. Probably not much that you have in common with your father and if you think about it it makes sense because the older you are, or just the bigger age gap you have with somebody, it's not rocket science, right? Unless you're somebody who hasn't really mentally matured as much as your age, then maybe you'd have more in common with somebody who's younger than you. So you can kind of see what I'm saying, right? It's it's not really a you know, mystery why he didn't have the best relationship with his father. Aside from that, uh, it's also believed that his father suffered from some sort of mental illness as well which Nobuyuki might have also just naturally taken on himself from just the environment. Now, Nobuyuki's mother, on the other hand, she was kind of the opposite. A lot of people said that she was too nice and too nurturing. She gave him and bought him whatever he wanted and spoiled him as a kid. And that kind of makes sense because they, they were well off, right? Like Nobuyuki's father, 
Um, he worked as like a driver for a company for a while until he started his own business and at that point I think they were pretty well off so Nobuyuki being like the only child he got whatever he wanted pretty much he lived a privileged life privileged but sheltered as we've already said he didn't really you know get along with other kids he had some social development issues clearly he was teased made fun of and he had this obsessive compulsive disorder with cleanliness. After finishing high school, Nobuyuki was even said to have been on his way home from like a part-time job one day, uh, I think it was like an automobile factory, and he was walking home from work and he walked into a spider web and he just starts freaking out, right? Like he runs home, traumatized from the incident, probably like jumps in the shower or at least like burns his clothes or whatever. He was just freaking out over the whole thing because he just made it way bigger of a deal in his own mind than it actually was because it said that this was the reason that he never worked another day in his life after this. Now fast forward to Nobuyuki's almost present age, right? His father has just passed away in a care facility after being kicked out by Nobuyuki himself. Like, yeah, he kicked out his own father out of his house and sent him to a care facility where he passed away of natural causes. It's said that at this point, Nobuyuki started to become more and more violent, and his real tendencies started to kind of come out. Neighbors often saw him breaking doors and windows, and his own mother was often seen with black eyes and bruises. By this time, he's also developed like this obsessive compulsion disorder with dirtiness and not wanting to like essentially let anybody get close to him because they're like in his cleanliness zone, right? So he doesn't want anybody to be even near him. He does not want to get dirty. He even avoids bathrooms as much as he possibly can. Eventually, Nobuyuki even purchased a stun gun. And why? Well, I don't know. But he used it on his own mother like several different times, maybe repeatedly, maybe many different times. We're, we're not really sure. And this is kind of tragic, but his mother reported like to the health clinics or facilities like, hey, I need help. I'm being abused. And I think she called them like th two or three times and didn't send anybody to help or investigate. Her, her claims just fell on deaf ears. All right, we're almost back to the abduction now, back to present time and back to Fusako. But before we get back to her, I just want to preface this by saying like, a year before Fusako was abducted, Nobuyuki tried to abduct another elementary school student. So there was another little girl walking home from school and Nobuyuki saw her and he was like, all right, I'm gonna take her with me. And so when he attempted to grab her, thankfully one of her friends saw them and she screamed out for help. And one of the teachers came over and tackled Nobuyuki and he was arrested. Now, for his punishment, okay, you guys already know, right? I'm a big um, critic of Japanese and Korean and just, you know, these really archaic justice system punishments. I'm not a fan of them. I'm not a fan of them at all. Guess how long he went to jail for the attempt to kidnap and abduct this little girl? Just, just take a guess. What? What was that? Well, you're probably wrong, okay? It was one year. Yeah, they put him in jail for one year. You know why it was only one year? Because it was his first offense. Wow. Way to go courts. Way to go justice systems. Way to go asshats who put this system in place. This makes total sense. Wow. Your first offense trying to kidnap and abduct and possibly murder, torture, or even worse, to a little child. Wow, it was your first time trying to do that? Oh, we'll give you a slap on the wrist, only one year. I can't, man, I just, I can't. All right, now we're finally back to the present. Fusako has been abducted. She is riding in the trunk of Nobuyuki's car. He's driving home, he finally gets there, but he doesn't go in through the front door because that would kind of like make him pass by his mom who lives on the first floor. He goes up to he wants to go up to the second floor, which is where he lives. It's it's kind of like um, it's kind of like a second apartment, right? But it, it's 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 like one apartment, technically. So what he does is he drives around to the back of the building and parks the car there. And from the back, there's a way where you can actually go right up to the second floor, and that's how he gets Fusako into the house without his mother knowing. 
at least without her knowing, yet. Once he took Fusako up to his room, he tied her up, he taped her mouth shut, and he was like, this is your home now. Like, this is your new home, you're not allowed to leave, if you leave, I'm gonna kill you. Actually, what he said was even worse. He said, I will kill you and throw your body in the mountains or even the ocean. So just imagine if you're nine years old and you're hearing something like this and you're in this situation, like you're, you're probably gonna be inclined to listen and believe it. After he put Fusaku into his room, he went back downstairs. He greeted his mother like it was just another day. And that is the beginning of her new life. Now on the day that she went missing, there was like so many people searching for her. The first day, I think it was like a hundred people. The second day, it was like double that. By the third day, they even had like a special unit on the case searching for her, like hundreds of people. They had people on the ground. They had aerial units searching like above. Tens of thousands of posters of Fusako's face were posted all around the town and the neighboring towns. And you know, people just really were trying to find her. It was an entire community, multiple communities effort. But unfortunately, they could not find any leads. There were some conspiracy theories, but no leads. One of the conspiracy theories was that Fusako was kidnapped by North Korean agents and taken to North Korea, which I know sounds a little bit far-fetched at first, but according to them, like there was other cases of similar things happening um, with people getting taken by North Koreans to North Korea. So I guess it's like, you can't rule it out completely. Now, to make matters worse, eventually somebody stepped forward claiming to be the culprit, claiming to be the one who abducted Fusako. And once police figured out that it wasn't really this guy, another person stepped forward and then another and then multiple people. And all this does is take away from the time and resources that are being put into actually finding her. But unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Because by November 19th, the amount of people looking for her was only like 80 now. And then eventually by Christmas, all searches had ceased. The case still remained open for all these years, but police just gave up. They didn't have any leads and they didn't know what to do. Despite looking at multiple different like sex offenders like on their list and on their radar, none of them thought to actually seek out and talk to Nobuyuki, even though he had been arrested and charged and sent to jail in the past for this exact same thing. Like, I looked into this and I was trying to figure out, like, why? Why? How could they possibly not suspect him? He literally did this a year ago. What is wrong with you people? And apparently, it all comes down to just an error. Either something was lost in the paperwork or whoever was, like, in charge of, like, looking at the offender's list, like, just forgot to put Nobuyuki's name on there or just didn't even do his due diligence. But if they had just done this one little step, they probably would have found her. And it's just, it's so, it's infuriating. It's like, this is multiple things that, <laughs> there's multiple issues here if you break it down. Like one, yeah, they didn't search him out, right? He's obviously a prime suspect. And even before that, the main issue is the lack of punishment to begin with. This guy went to jail for the exact same mother freaking thing a year ago and he only got one year of jail, and a year later he literally goes out and does it again. I'm t my mind is blown. My mind is blown. It's just, it's, it's ludicrous. I don't know what else to say. I'm just, I don't know what else to say. Absolutely ridiculous. <sighs> Anyways, uh, so, during the nine years and two months that Fusako was locked up, basically as his um, family member, as he called her. But she was not a family member, obviously. She was a captive and he was her captor. Over the next nine years, Fusako never left the room. And like, just listen to that sentence again. Over the next nine years, Fusako never left the room. I know like you might think like, okay, maybe it's just an expression. She probably did leave the room on occasion to go to the bathroom or go downstairs, or maybe he let her go into the living room. Uh, no. She literally never left the room. And if you think about it, it makes sense, okay? 
when you're nine years old, when you are a child who has barely experienced life and you have somebody literally threaten you with a knife, um, has abducted you away from your family, has tied you up and kidnapped you and threatened to kill you if you ever say anything or leave this room, you're probably not going to leave that room. And in order to kind of, you know, cement this kind of mindset into Fusako, Nobuyuki, uh, for like the first three months or several months, she had her hands and legs tied and she wasn't allowed to, you know, hardly move at all until eventually he let her, you know, be able to walk around the room at least. If she ever tried to escape or if she ever didn't respond to him whenever he called out to her, if she ever did anything so much as to piss him off, she would get beaten up. Apparently Nobuyuki even like practiced martial arts on her. I don't know why. I, I guess like he kind of used her as like a sparring bag at times. But I, I will say this guys, like <sighs> for those of you guys that have watched my video on Junko, uh, it's my previous video. You can, <sighs> I'm not gonna diminish anyone's case and say it's worse or better than any others, but I'm just thankful that you know, Fusako was not... <sighs> I'm glad she didn't have to experience some of the same types of horrors. During the time that they were together, he he bought her new clothes. Um, he didn't buy her women's clothes because uh, Nobuyuki was, like, scared that if I'm seen buying women's clothes, maybe it'll give it away. Maybe I'll incriminate myself. So he, he shared his own clothes with her, and, and then he, uh, he also cut her hair short. But the thing is, like... Sometimes he didn't even pay for the clothes. Like, half the time he was shoplifting the clothes and, like, stealing it. And this is a little bit off topic, but I thought it was interesting. When this whole thing came to a close, he, <laughs> the prosecutors also charged him with, you know, shoplifting the clothing. So I'm just saying, like, you get what you deserve. And, I mean, everything. Now, aside from that, Nobuyuki also, you know, has this obsession with dirtiness, right? And, like, staying clear away from anything dirty. So... He stays clear of the bathrooms himself, right? So because of that, he doesn't let Fusako ever use the bathroom, but instead he like sets up like bags on the floor in the room and you know, she kind of has to use that to go to the bathroom. So she never actually, she really didn't ever leave the room like for any reason. As far as hygiene goes, um, I'm not sure like how accurate this statement is because I think it was translated, but apparently she only had like one bath like once? I don't know if he like sponge bathed her normally, I would assume so. But she only had one actual physical bath where she sat in a tub and uh, that's because she like fell and got herself dirty and so uh, Nobuyuki like blindfolded her, took her down to the bathroom and bathed her um, and cleaned her off then. But um, accordingly, that was the only time she actually ever took a bath. She didn't have a TV to listen to during her entire capture except for like the last year. He finally let her start watching TV and he made her record his horse racing on like uh, on the TV. Yeah, he was an avid gambler on like horse races. So he would make her like record the races while he was like out. And if she didn't like record it by the time he got home, uh, yeah, she gets in trouble. She was, however, able to listen to a radio, at least, you know, from the beginning until the end. Now, remember the stun gun? Yeah, well, uh... Welcome back, stun gun, enter. He used the stun gun multiple times on her if she disobeyed him. And it got to a point where she got so kind of like used to the stun gun that she would even use it on herself to kind of just make herself more used to the pain so that she could endure it even more. That to me is just, it's tragic, but it's also like, you know, she's a smart girl, you know, you, you got to give her a pat on the back for just being brave like that. Uh, the lighting in the room, right, let's talk about that, right? There's, there's allegedly hardly any light really coming through that room, so she barely got any sunlight over those nine years, so she suffered from this, um, this sickness called jaundice. It's like a sickness where your skin pigmentation, like, turns yellowish along with your eyes because you're just, you're just not getting enough sun. Uh, and it just makes you really weak in general. And on top of that, she was only fed like once a day and it was either like, like a lunchbox, you know, like a bento box or just maybe some like instant ramen. And he only fed her once a day for like the first six years until she, uh, collapsed or something and like had a bruise on her leg and he thought, oh, like maybe she's becoming like a diabetic. So then he added like a rice, little rice patty 
a little rice ball to her daily meal from then on. But dude, her weight dropped uh, from like, like 100 pounds to like 80 pounds or something like that. Because she was just really malnourished. Her hands, her arms and legs were like super skinny from just not eating enough and her muscles had like atrophy. She could barely walk. And you know, it's just a terrible, terrible predicament to be in. This isn't really like a bad thing, but I don't wanna say it's a good thing because I don't really see anything good about this. But Nobuyuki did allegedly homeschool uh, Fusako and like teach her, you know, basic things that you would learn in school. So, you know, that the only reason I'm saying that's good is because when you're locked away as a child until you're an adult, it's like, it's gonna have serious repercussions on your social development and your, your mental development and just the way you develop anything. So I, I'm just glad that she got, I don't know, some education. But anyways, as far as, you know, mental, mentally how she developed and um, how she is, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, let's talk about her freedom. As I said earlier, she never left the room once, right? Because she was just so scared and she had this fear instilled into her mind, like burned, ingrained into her mind. Nobuyuki didn't even have to lock the door sometimes, like it was left open and Fusako could have left if she chose to, but she never did because she was scared. And understandably so, there's just, there's nothing you can do at that point. When when you're mentally just beaten like that, you can't do anything even if the opportunity is staring at you right in the face. Now, remember earlier when I said his mother had called like the, you know, mental health staff uh, multiple times in the past, but they never came to her aid? Well, guess what? They finally did their job. On January 28th, 2000, like a whole car full of medical staff showed up to Nobuyuki's home and they went up to the second floor because, you know, they nobody was answering and then when he opened the door, he was like he was sleeping, so he woke up and he's like, "What the f like, who are you people? Like, what are you doing in my house?" and he was hysterical, right? But obviously there's there's like there's like five or six of these guys, so they subdued him. They, you know, gave him an injection to a sedative to, you know, make him fall asleep and they were just going to take him away to the medical facility. But there was one thing they noticed. The blanket in the corner was moving. And so they approached it and sure enough, when they removed the blanket, there was Fusako. Now at first, trembling in fear, not knowing who these guys are, your mental willpower has just been beaten to a pulp. You know what she says? She says, can I stay here? Can I stay in this room? But sure enough, the medical staff are like, no, no, it, it, it's okay. Just come with us. Once they got to the police station, the police questioned Fusako. They got her name and sure enough, they realized this is the girl that went missing almost 10 years ago. And on that day, it was a joyous day for her parents because she was finally reunited with them and they were overjoyed to see her. It was truly probably the happiest day of their lives. They commented that <laughs> she changed so much from age nine to 19 and <laughs> they couldn't even recognize her, but um, they never gave up hope. You know, and they were they were just really happy to see her. Now, one important thing to note is that uh, upon medical examination, uh, professionals were able to uh, put together that Fusako, during her entire ordeal being, you know, held captive, she was never, you know, uh, submitted to any form of essay, right? You guys, you know what that is, okay? I don't have to explain it. And YouTube definitely doesn't want me to explain it. And when Nobuyuki was questioned about this, like, did you ever do anything with her in this way? He said, no, I didn't. And they said, why? And he said, because I always saw her as a friend and uh, a part of my family. And I don't know, I, I guess I can kind of believe that, you know, he's mentally, he's not all there, you know, he's, he's not mentally fit, right? He has issues going on. So I think it's totally in the realm of plausible that that was what he saw and that was how he thought. 
Now you're probably wondering what happened to Nobuyuki's mother, um, right? Because how could she have not known this was going on for nine years and two months? Well, you gotta remember that A, she's like in her 70s, right? She's an elderly woman. B, uh, she is also a victim of Nobuyuki's, you know, beatings and just <sighs> abuse. She was the one who called and she was, you know, the reason that this all, you know, came about in the first place and the police were able to find them because she kept calling and finally somebody responded. However, the police, they, even though they, they think she might have known, they ended up not charging her, you know, with uh, any sort of accomplice, you know, uh, charges. And so on February 10th, 2000, only Nobuyuki was charged. And honestly, I don't know. If you ask me how I feel about that, or, you know, if you ask yourself how you feel about that, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I'm more, right now, in this moment, I'm more focused on Nobuyuki's punishment. You know, less on the mother. That That's all I'll say. I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Because she was a victim too. It's just, it's a lot to unpack, so I don't know. Let me know your thoughts about that down below in the comments. Now, for Nobuyuki's punishment, he was found guilty and sentenced to 14 years in prison. And guess what? His defense, they tried to claim mental insanity and tried to, you know, like, reduce his sentence. Yeah, good luck with that. They did get it reduced to 11 years by the Tokyo High Court, but um, the prosecution then appealed that and they got it put back to the original sentence of 14 years in your face. Now, if you ask me, 14 years is not long enough, okay? 14 years when you had, you literally took that little girl's entire childhood into your her young adult life. You robbed her of that and you have destroyed a big part of her that will impact her for the rest of her life. You, you could very easily have just destroyed her life. So again, it's like actions have dire consequences. 14 years for what you've done, which could possibly affect somebody their entire life? I don't know, man. If you ask me, I think you should go away for a lot longer. Anyways, 14 years later, at the age of 52, Nobuyuki gets out of jail. And from what I read, uh, he didn't receive any, any help or mental rehabilitation during his time in jail, which Japan needs to work on because, you know, whether you're in jail or not, you should still be able to receive, you know, mental rehabilitation or, or therapy, counseling, or whatever it is you need because mental health is important and it shouldn't be taken lightly whether you're in prison or not. Because, you know, I, I shouldn't have to say this, I'm sure you guys already know this, but you don't have to be in prison to be in prison. Like, do you know what I mean? You're your mental health can create a prison for you. So it's not something to be taken lightly. Anyways, by the time Nobuyuki got out of prison, um, you know, his mother had already passed away. He never got help for his mental issues, so they probably got worse and he wasn't able to get a job. So he was living on disability, getting money from the government and eventually he passed away too. I'm not exactly, I don't know, I couldn't, find the de maybe I maybe I didn't see the details of it but I'm not sure if he passed away naturally or or what so if you guys can fill me in on that little part that'd be appreciated now as for Fusako she obviously suffered from PTSD um, she was malnutritioned but it wasn't anything that she could you know recover you know in a short time she she ate more she started to go out more her parents you know nursed her back to health and before you knew it, she was walking about and hanging out and everything was, you know, back to normal. Of course, you know, mentally, she suffered a lot and that's something that can't be repaired like the body. She suffered a lot from nightmares and, you know, uh, she had difficulty socializing with people. And uh, I think it, they said that um, when you spoke to her, even though she was 19, it was like speaking to a child still because mentally she was not able to develop much past her age when she was abducted. And that to me is, it's heartbreaking because in a way she was robbed of her, 
her ability to develop as a person. And that is one of the most tragic things you can do to somebody, in my opinion. And that's why, you know, I want to stress, it's like, oh, you kidnapped somebody for nine years, but hey, I didn't kill them. I didn't do any sort of like SA, so it could have been a lot worse. And look, they're all back to their family, says the defense. So why don't you give this guy a little bit of a pass, right? So it's like, no, because your actions have had dire consequences on the victim's entire life. You have literally ruined them in so many ways. You have robbed them of their ability to mentally develop and grow as a person, and they can't get that back, you know, easily, if at all. You know, that's the takeaway. Yes, we got her back, but you can't get that back. That's something you can't get back. From what I've read, um, she's good now. You know, uh, Fusako is doing well. She works on, you know, the rice fields of her parents' family. She has a driver's license and uh, she likes photography. Um, she still has trouble socializing and interacting with people, but you know, fair enough. The important thing is that she's living her life, you know, and that's, that's just something she never really got to do. All right, in closing, I will say, Again, so many, so many parts of this story, there were so many parts where things could have been handled better, right? Nobuyuki's name should have been on the list of suspects. They should have gone to him first. He should have been at the top of the priority list, but he wasn't. His name wasn't even on the list. It got dropped somehow. Another thing is when the mother kept calling about getting beaten by her son and like, hey, I need help. Nobody came the first several times. Nobody came to help her until finally they did. And guess what? They finally came to help her. What else they discover? A whole freaking abduction. Yeah, maybe you should respond to these things a little bit better, guys. And this part, oh, this part just pissed me off. On the day that Fusako was found and reunited with her parents, you know what the chief of police was doing? Instead of going in to see this little girl, you know, who is now a young adult get reunited with her parents that your department was trying to find over nine years ago instead of coming you know meet them and greet them and talk with them what did you do you decided to play a game of mahjong with another regional chief and you wanted to go and play your games and and do politics and play that game yeah well guess what uh you're fired the man came under a lot of uh, media attention and uh, yeah, he got completely like just destroyed. And eventually he just resigned. And uh, the regional chief that he was also playing the games with, uh, he resigned too. Good riddance, get out of here, don't come back. So all in all, a lot of things could have been handled better. They should have been handled better. And I hope they get handled better in the future. All right, and that, is the end of the story. Let me know what you guys thought about this one down below in the comments, thoughts, questions, concerns, complaints. You guys told me last time that you enjoyed this kind of podcast type of video format, so I'm doing it again and I hope it's okay. If you guys wanna help me out, then be sure to leave a like and uh, subscribe, leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on this whole thing. New videos are coming soon and like I said, if you guys want to hang out with me off of YouTube, then I am live on Twitch, you know, every other day or so. That's going to be linked down below, and you can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I know I haven't posted it on there in a little while, but I'm getting to it. Just, just follow me anyway. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and um, yeah, I mean that. Thanks for watching. <laughs> and until next time, I'll see you guys in the next video. Good night.